morning, everyone. They don't start running until 11. Oh. I, I, I see uh, you must all be familiar uh, with our author, or else you're maybe your own family or something. It's, it's a great, great, great turnout for Alex. Um, um, welcome to Politics and Prose. I'm, I'm Brad Graham, the co owner of the bookstore, along with my wife, Lisa Muscatine. And uh, it really is a treat to be hosting uh, Washington Post columnist elect, uh, uh, Alexandra uh, Petri, uh, who's here again, uh, this time to talk about her new book, uh, Alexandra Petri's. Um, and Petri's U.S. History, Important American Documents, parentheses, I made up. <laughs> now, if uh, any of you are not reading Alex's columns in the Post, uh, you're missing out on some very entertaining stuff. Uh, her often absurdist musings on the latest political and pop culture news uh, showcases uh, uh, they showcase a great comic sense and provide a welcomed lighter take on the events of the day. Uh, her previous book of essays three years ago, Nothing is Wrong and Here is Why, um, <laughs> focused on uh, contemporary topics such as the QAnon conspiracies and, and the Trump administration. Uh, the new collection uh, looks back in time and provides uh, Alex's satirical take on the way things were or uh, conceivably could have been. Uh, although Alex confesses right on the first page of the book that she's not an historian. Uh, she does have an impressive knowledge of U.S. history, evidently inspired by the many summers that she spent as a youth uh, tramping around battlefields and through historic houses and farms, apparently at the instigation of her parents, whom she thanks um, in the acknowledgments. Um, anyway, you don't really need to be a historian to rewrite history, as many elected <laughs> officials lately <laughs> have been demonstrating. Um, they've made quite a mess of it, actually, uh, coming up with, with lots of distorted versions of our nation's past. Uh, so Alex's point is that if, if, you're, if you're going to rewrite history badly and inaccurately, uh, why not at least have fun doing it <laughs> and imagine some truly bizarre historical documents like uh, sexting between uh, John and Abigail Adams, <laughs> or the Gettysburg Address by Aaron Sorkin, <laughs> or a draft of Fear and Loathing in Las Vegas where Hunter Thompson forgot to bring the drugs. <laughs> and, and those are just a few of the more than 80 inventions in Alex's book. Rarely has history been so enjoyable. In conversation with Alex uh, this evening uh, will be uh, another fine journalist, uh, Robert Samuels. Uh, he, uh, he's now a staff writer at, at the New Yorker, uh, but he used to work at, at the Washington Post. And he also is co-author of a great book that came out last year about the lifetimes and martyrdom of George, George Floyd entitled, uh, His Name is George Floyd. Uh, so please join me in welcoming Alex Petri and Robert Samuels. And you thought no one would come. <laughs> oh, hey! Friends. This is nice. All these people are here for you. <laughs> Hi, everyone. My name's Robert Samuels. I'm a staff writer at The New Yorker. I'm a longtime friend with Alex. Uh, and I think the first question that we need to get out of the way is, how do you pronounce your last name? Yes. <laughs> it's Petri. Petri. Everyone say Petri. Petri. Okay, oh, cool. Yay. Like now, the letter P and try. Petri. I feel like all my mnemonic devices just confuse people. I'm like, it's like a vegetable that's making an effort. They're like, carrot attempt. And I'm like, no. It's not a mnemonic device, Alex. It's <laughs> I'm getting this farther from it. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and so, we're, so there are a bunch of things that we want to do. There might be a quiz at the end with special prizes, which is <laughs> wonderful. Uh, as uh, the owner here said, I'm the author of, I'm only going to plug this book three times. His name is George Floyd, One Man's Life and the Struggle for Racial Justice, a humor book, <laughs> um, which totally makes sense why we're doing this. Uh, but, you know, Gene Weingarten uh, was at Rasika today, so he couldn't do it. <laughs> so... <laughs> 
here we are. And so uh, we thought a single spice a take. Single, yeah. <laughs> only one. No, curry. One, spi- one spicy take. Not, oh, not, oh. <laughs> not too spicy. <laughs> not too. Um, so sorry, one thing I, I feel like lots of people have not actually heard your voice read their column. You know read your columns. So I thought it would be great today to have you read some of this hilarious book so we can get some chuckles. Ooh, all right. Well, I there's a couple pieces I was thinking of doing, and I felt like this one would actually be topical. Um, so one of the sections is called Songs Not of Myself by Walt Whitman, <laughs> um, which is his, you know, if, if CDs had been invented, these covers would be on a number of CDs. But instead, Walt Whitman will come to your house and intone them in a bardly manner until you can get him to stop. Um, And one of them is called Barbie Girl. And I I thought I'd share that with you now. Barbie, I salute you. Ken, I return your salutation. In my vehicle, four-wheeled, purring above the open road, will you ride beside me? Allons-y, Ken. Jump in, then, Barbie. Jump in, my camarado. I am a Barbie, eternal feminine. I celebrate myself and sing myself. For this is a world of Barbies, and I am in it. Content in my life, in my hair, glistening, and its plenteous combs. I will go to the bank by the woods and become undisguised and naked. I will go anywhere. I am unashamed. I am Barbie. I contain multitudes. What your imagination contains, I contain. Make me walk, make me talk, do whatever you please. I can act like a star, for I am a star. I can beg on my knees, for there is no shame in begging. There is nothing shameful in my body. I am Barbie, I am yours. You can touch, for I write first the poetry of the body, of its plastic, of its feet, tiny, not load-bearing, ankles, calves, knees, bendless, hips, rotary, the blank, flat expanse between hips and hair, the firm orbic sisters, the lustrous bounty of coiffure, plastic, skin-shelled, glistening from the lathe. I am fantastical. I embrace my bounteous life. I love you, Ken. Moving. And then I thought I would do one more, which explained what time I arrived here. <laughs> um, so much has, it's called the Hour Men. And much has been written about the exploits of the Minute Men, the American civilian militias who swore to be ready in a minute to help fight the British during the Revolutionary War. This seems made up to me, and I refuse to believe in it. People simply can't be ready in a minute. <laughs> here, I think, is a more likely account of how things would have gone in the recently unearthed diary of the most famous hour man, Nathaniel Hancock. (laughs) June 16th, 1775, 3 p.m. The call for aid is up. Bunker Hill is going to be attacked, and we men are all being mustered. They came house to house telling everyone to get ready. Terrific, I said. It will not take me more than one minute to get ready. (laughs) Good, Benjamin said, because we are really serious about this one minute thing, and we are going to be marching pretty much immediately. (laughs) Absolutely, I said. This is the hour of fate. I put on my most fierce-looking coat, buttoning each button with care, and gathered all the supplies I might need. Are you ready, Nathaniel? My wife Bess inquired, glancing out the window. All the Minutemen have assembled in the square, and they are about to march. I told her that I was ready, which was essentially true. (laughs) But then I remembered that we might need snacks. (laughs) The Minutemen are leaving, Bess said. That is fine, I said. I'm ready to go, which was true, although I was engaged in slicing carrots and placing them into a linen sack so that if we needed to have carrots when we got to Bunker Hill, we would not have to slice them there. (laughs) Nathaniel, Benjamin said, are you ready? We are marching right now, but if you are almost ready, we can wait. (laughs) I am almost ready, I said. It will take me one minute tops to get ready. That is what you said nine, 20 minutes ago, Benjamin said. Well, I'm ready now, I said. You don't have your musket, my wife said. (laughs) I'm ready, I said to Benjamin. I just need to find where I put my musket. (laughs) Nathaniel, Benjamin said, we cannot wait around for you to find where you put your musket if that isn't top of mind information for you right now. (laughs) It is top of mind information for me right now, I said. It is definitely in the house somewhere. And I know I put it somewhere special where I would remember it. (laughs) Nathaniel, Benjamin said, we are going now. I am completely ready once I find my musket, I said. I have narrowed down the location of my musket to three possible places. (laughs) Okay, Benjamin said. We are leaving. I just need to put on my boots and grab my musket, I said. You don't even have your boots on, Benjamin inquired. I have foot 
footwear on, I said, but it occurred to me that we will probably be walking, and I'm going to want to be in boots. <laughs> yes, Benjamin said. This was all on the list I gave out earlier. I know, I said. I read the list, and I put it right next to my musket. <laughs> Benjamin sighed heavily. Are you still waiting around for this guy? Somebody else said in what I thought was an unnecessarily unpleasant tone. <laughs> what you should do, my wife said to Benjamin in an urgent, soft voice that I believe she thought I could not hear, is tell him an hour earlier than you actually <laughs> need him to be there. I can't do that, Benjamin said. We are minute men. And our whole thing is that we have to be ready a minute to go to a location that was not previously specified. Anyway, we're going to march now, and we'll have to catch up with you and your husband later. And with that, they marched off, a cloud of dust rising in their wake. I'm entirely... Uh, June 16th, 1775, 4 p.m. I am entirely ready to leave for Bunker Hill now. <laughs> but I wonder if I hadn't better wait until the morning. Probably if the British are there, they will still be there later. <laughs> if they're having a battle, I don't want to interrupt them in the middle of it, which I imagine would be pretty awkward. <laughs> they might already be firing their muskets, and they might not know that it was I, Nathaniel Hancock, arriving with ca carrots and other assorted forms of aid and succor, and they might do something they regretted. Best thinks I had better go because people will pass remarks, but if they win, that will prove that my presence was not necessary, and if they lose, it will be a relief that I was not there. She does not wish them to think me a coward. She would not think me a coward, she explained, but other people might think it. <laughs> anyway, I'm leaving now as soon as I put on my boots. June 17th, 1775, 7 p.m. I have just gotten back from Bunker Hill. It was a little awkward as I ran into everyone on the road as they were coming back. I had only gotten about halfway there when I saw a great column of dust coming down the road. It was everyone who had set out, mostly, although some of them had wounds that they did not have before, and I did not see Benjamin at all. I tried to blend into the group because that seemed less disruptive than waving them down and having to explain where I had been. I fell into step and marched along with them as unobtrusively as I could. A newspaper writer came and asked us about the recent engagement, and I said loudly, Bunker Hill was the spot. I will never forget being there at Bunker Hill. What a battle the Battle of Bunker Hill was. And then I offered him a sliced carrot. <laughs> Everyone around me was looking at me, and after the writer left, they made some very stinging remarks about how if I'd been at the engagement, I would know that it was at Breed's Hill and not at Bunker. There was really nothing to say after that, and the march back into town was quite long. I'm not sure if I'm welcome in the Minutemen any longer. Oh, <laughs> bravo. You know, it's so funny you read that one, Alex, because I realized the time we'd become friends, the time we'd become friends, uh, was when I read one of your columns about explaining to your friends why it's OK for you to be late all the time. <laughs> <laughs> and I know this comparison comes with you a lot, but it reminded me of something Sofia Vergara said once. All and the time. All the time, <laughs> I know, yeah. And she said, people who like to be late uh, know they can make an entrance, which is, I think, a part of it. I don't know about Mr. Hancock. Um, well, he had carrots, so <laughs> that's an entrance, yeah. I think. Uh, so, you know, I think a lot of people want to know this. When did you know you were funny? I'm still not sure. I'm glad that no. people were laughing. <laughs> uh, probably, I, I was trying to be funny from a very early age, uh, much to my parents' chagrin. I would sit there, I'd be like, let's do a live show, and I will, uh, you know, here's some tickets. They're like, you are an only child. We're the only two people here. Why are you trying to ticket an event? <laughs> but it's that entrepreneurial spirit. That, no, we're uh, an American. But no, so I was always reading books of jokes and like, it's been funny because now I have a junior family member, uh, otherwise known as a child. Not sure why I said it like that. Um, she's still, uh, but, and she's found all of my old books and now it's like watching her. I'm like, oh, that explains a lot that that was the book that I kept reading. It is all books like bad jokes for kids, worst jokes for kids, <laughs> just like book after book of jokes. Like my poor friends, we had a camping trip in I think like seventh grade. <laughs> And I went to the internet and I printed out like 60 pages of jokes from online. 60? <laughs> like a good number, like a, a meaty packet. <laughs> and I just read them as we walked along the trail. <laughs> and, and the worst thing was I didn't get 
all of the jokes. <laughs> yeah. There was one joke, uh, there like a you know a, a counselor or whatnot walking along with us, and I'm sitting there. This woman, the joke was a woman went to a grocery store, and the guy there's and she and he, she goes, sir, do you have any nuts? And he goes, no. And she goes, do you have any dates? And he goes, ma'am, if I had nuts, I would have dates. And I'm like, this joke is a mystery to me. <laughs> and, and the guy's like, you need to shut this down. And anyway, uh, so I think inadvertently, inadvertently for a long time and increasingly deliberately, hopefully, as I've aged. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it's... Um, I, I always wanted to be funny. Um... And I had a terrible sense of humor. So, like, my favorite sitcom as a child was Dear John. Do you know what Dear John? Never. Oh, Dear John, it starred Judd Hirsch. And Noted he was comedic. A, yes, comedic talent. Yeah, I thought he was just like Steve Martin. And uh, he was a divorcee. His wife left him a note on his desk at oh, Dear, Dear John. John. Yeah. yeah. And he, uh, it was him, and he goes to a group for people who had broken up, had been in breakups, and some of them had addictions. Oh. And I'd watch it every day. <laughs> I didn't get one of the jokes. Did you have a show like that? Yeah, I had yeah. several because TV was not, like during the weeknights, when the school nights and I had homework, I was not supposed to be watching TV. So I religiously watched like the Friday night lineup that was on ABC. Like for, uh, there was a window there when I was watching Madigan Men. Does anyone remember Madigan Men? Yeah. No one, and that's correct. <laughs> <laughs> it was like a, a similar show energy, yeah. like Gabriel Byrne, uh, also a noted comedic figure. Uh, yeah. Gabriel Byrne, they all had sweaters. I think the joke was that they were like Irish, but a family. Yeah. Irish and a family. And anyway, and then I would I would like tape SNL and it was it was a lot of like or eliminate. Uh that's also That is a joke, that is comedy. Yeah, yeah, no, I think like the truest comedy is in any kind of reality show where you start with four people and at the end of the night there has to be a hot tub I feel like <laughs> any hot tub based elimination reality TV show but I think like had I been watching TV more I would have been like more discriminating in my sense of like ah yes like now we're going to tune into an HBO classic it's not TV it's HBO and instead I was just like oh boy eliminate yeah. so. <laughs> five people starting and the night ending up in a hot tub it sounds yeah. like uh -huh. Joe Biden's Senate um, when, <laughs> could you talk, <laughs> uh, could you talk a little bit, one of the things that I find so interesting about this book compared to your first book, uh, which sort of went along the lines of you talking about your series of awkward interactions, was that this one, you know, it focuses more on others aside from yourself. And I thought looking at history nowadays was really interesting. So I was hoping you could talk to us about why you decided to have this approach to your humor for this book. Well, to me, I always like, one of my favorite things about history is like really old time history, like Herodotus and Thucydides. And I, I love how back in the day when you were writing a history, you would just be like, I'm gonna make all of this up. Yes. And, like Thucydides at the beginning of the histories, he's like, so there are going to be some speeches, but I wasn't there, so I've just come up with remarks that seem to me to be appropriate for the occasion. <laughs> and I love that. And <laughs> as somebody who was always like sitting there with my documentary history of the United States, I love how that you can just have a book and be like, these are the documents that are history. I'm like, but what if instead you could just make up the documents, yeah. just like an inch to the left, like the documents that should have existed. And I feel like it's of a piece with the rest of my writing where one of the ways I go in to trying to do satire is sometimes like, if this is the case, what else had to be the case? And so like, if there's a version of Fear and Loathing in Las Vegas where everyone did drugs heavily, there might also be a version where they forgot to bring the drugs <laughs> and you had to hang out with your friend that you do the drugs with for a car ride without doing any drugs. Yeah. And wouldn't that be fun? Um, <laughs> and so just going through and thinking like, what else could there have been? And like, I also, love just like when writers have like a very specific voice yeah. so like going through and being like Raymond Chandler and what he did with uh similes that was like a fun challenge to try to be like 
if I had to do a simile, how could I do that? Um, so it gave me an excuse to spend a lot of time just like reading similes and banging my head against the wall. You know, <laughs> it's so funny because I actually like, you can see I took this seriously as a textbook. And I, oh, good. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I actually highlighted the, the, the Chandler chapter because I, I was interested in you talking about it. Uh, so one of the interesting things about this book is that it's not all just you. Right, like there are actual serious lines that have been done by other writers. There's uh, Nathaniel Hawthorne. There's Great Gatsby. There are a bunch to make a, a, a title. There's this really interesting segment between Lauren Hansberry and Sunmaid, who are trying to give her raisins. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so, in this. Uh, chapter, uh, it says, Chandler says, uh, I pulled my car into the hotel parking lot where the broad had said the sexual harassment seminar was going to be. <laughs> uh, there were a lot of cars in the lot, and I scraped up against one of them, just gentle-like in greeting. <laughs> Two spots remained in the lot, and I took a little of each so they wouldn't be offended, feel offended. Okay, so was that you or Chandler? That was me. Okay. That just was just like me trying my best to describe what it's like to park. Um, <laughs> which is you try to be as nice to all the spots as you can and take a little bit of all of them. Yeah. So tell us, <laughs> tell us a little bit about when you're trying to channel someone's voice. What sort of research and imagination goes into that? Well, there's a lot of like... Like, there's one chapter that's uh, The Muppets at D-Day, which was one of my... <laughs> it's it's the, the most polarizing chapter so yeah. far. Yeah. Um, because it's like, well, you know, the Looney Tunes, they were doing all this World War II stuff. What if the Muppets had gotten in on the action erroneously, you know, 30 years before they were founded? That's That makes sense. And so uh, d I would just sit there and I would get a World War II documentary, which is always on on TV at, at some point. If you just turn a TV on... If, if you to go through all the channels and there's not a World War II documentary on something is the matter, you've fallen into a parallel universe, there's always, there's always like on the dad channel or like the angry dad channel. Um, <laughs> and so uh, I, I watched a lot of World War II uh, documentaries. And, but I also, in the other window, I had like Sesame Street running. And so it, it was sort of a lot of like, what is the tone that I want to get and if I'm not like because sometimes you'll write a sentence and be like this doesn't sound like I want it to sound and then you have to go read and listen to a bunch more sentences like the Walt Whitman section was really hard because his rhythm like internally is not where my rhythm is internally <laughs> he like will de declare and then stop and then declare and then stop and I'm like no 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 <laughs> that's not how you talk you have to hedge and sort of do this and <laughs> gesture and pause and yeah so he was hard to nail down, and I had to listen to a lot of spoken word Walt Whitman poetry, which is available on uh, Spotify if mm. you check it out. <laughs> <laughs> Plug for Spotify. There's another one, <laughs> yeah. you know, because there's another one uh, where you channel Carl Sandburg. Oh my God. <laughs> and also Allen Ginsberg. I was yeah. really into the poetry. Yeah, you were. Because I have a bone to pick with Carl Sandburg because Let's his poetry it. is so weird <laughs> and nobody talks about it. <laughs> <laughs> and, like, his Chicago poem is just there. Like he and Chicago have something going yeah. on there. Like the the chemistry, the energy, the raw sexual tension between him and the city of Chicago. Hog butchers, you, man. You don't yeah. have poetry like that anymore. Where people are like, so Carla, you okay? You okay? You feel normal about the city of Chicago? Um, people just like write poems about how they're feeling instead of like this. I, I want Chicago to wreck me. It's like no, Carl Sanders, calm down. Um, so. Anyway, uh, and having, like, I feel like that was one of those things where, like, in those books that they gave you when you were a kid of, like, here's an anthology of, like, literature that is important, it would always just be in there, like, without comment. Just like, this is a normal poem. Probably poetry should be like this. <laughs> Memorize it. And you, so years later, I'm just like, but can we acknowledge that that was a little odd? And so, uh, 
Yeah, uh, and he also wrote a biography of Abraham Lincoln that has just every paragraph of it is wild. Like, he had one where he's like, he walked through that door, only the first of many doors he would encounter in a long life of windows and doors. And I'm just like, <laughs> what? Someone needs to look into Carl Sandburg and figure out what's going on there. You have to tell them what happens with the rest of the poems that are in there, in the Sandberg infos. So what happened? Oh, it's just uh, other cities that he's written erotic poetry. Yeah. <laughs> just full, just through the, the whole Midwest. Um. I've never been so titillated about Cincinnati. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's, its name is Double Sin. Sin, Sin, Eddie, all right. Okay. So, so uh, you know, um, we, we, we talked a little bit briefly about what we're going to do, uh, but you know, as a journalist and author of his name is George Floyd, <laughs> I uh, try not to give the precision, precise questions, but you did lead into one of them, which is talking about how this collection, it features uh, rhinoceroses, and I did look it up to make sure the plural of rhinoceroses was in fact rhinoceroses. Uh, Rhinoceros is working to help Teddy Roosevelt's political political career. Uh, the death scene of a beloved Muppet at D-Day. A frustrated Richard Rogers trying to get Hammerstein, Oscar Hammerstein, to get rid of exclamation points. Uh, my first... <laughs> My first iteration of this question was, what is wrong with you? <laughs> uh, my more polite iteration of the question is, how did you decide what to do and what to stay away from? You know, what wasn't funny? Well, I think my goal for this book was like, this was things that I thought were funny. Yeah. <laughs> and so like the, the Muppets maybe people disagree with, but mostly I was like, what are things that I feel like I can joke about and people will enjoy that process. And so I was like, I have a lot of feelings about Nathaniel Hawthorne and I'm mad about him. Um, <laughs> and here's the scarlet letter. Yes. Who is clapping for yeah. Yeah. Mad about yeah. Nathaniel Hawthorne? Yeah. Time's so. up, Nathaniel. <laughs> Yeah, you know, this was a man who would refer to, like, watching his own child as babysitting. And yeah. we don't, it's not okay, Nathaniel Hawthorne. He wrote a whole diary of, like, his time with Julian and Little Bunny. I think he killed his son's rabbit. Yeah. If not, he threatened to. Anyway, fun, fun <laughs> side note, but Bo Bowden's sexiest man. No, so it's just like, <laughs> I just wanted to be like, as I say in the introduction, there's, like, books of, like, intense research and there's books that are like Rush Limbaugh has written oh I mean never mind that's a surprise from later I mean no he hasn't no uh, but there's, nothing's up yeah there's a book that's like Bill O'Reilly has decided that like the moon landing was fake and JFK killed George Washington and he will write a book about it and like those are the two genres of history book and I was like I just want to write a, a history book for people who are like Warren G. Harding's sexy letters are not enough. I want more, <laughs> just like that. And so that's, that was what I was trying to provide. Uh, you know, one of, one of the most amazing things in <laughs> this book is in your acknowledgments, you thank the fact checker? Oh, yes. <laughs> what were they checking? <laughs> 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 no, so here's what I, so I was like, well, I'm making jokes about but I don't want to be like making incorrect jokes. And so I like sent this to, and if you want to learn exactly how long it takes a letter to cross the Atlantic, a good way of doing that is trying to write like, what if John and Abigail Adams tried to do sexting? And then the fact checker will tell you that is too fast for the letter. It, it could not have gotten across the Atlantic in that time. You've got to change all the dates. And spoiler alert, I did not change the dates because otherwise other dates didn't work out. So it's, the, the letters are going too fast. Don't If you think that you can get an 18th century letter across the Atlantic based on what's in the book, that's wrong. Yeah. Um, ditto the Cotton Mather section. Anyway, the one, the, that actually happened to a family in England. Cotton Mather didn't do it. He just wrote about it in Mysteries of the Invisible World. Anyway, I did too much Cotton Mather research. Um, but so yeah, cotton heads, please don't come after me. Uh, but yeah, increase the heads, we can talk. Um, but the, all right, Mather family jokes. We're doing it. So uh, no, there was one fact check thing that, that was like 
very funny, and I'm now forgetting what it was, but I'm trying to think. Well, well, I'll just... It, it evaporated and vanished away. Well, you know, if you get... Remember, we can get back to it. I mean, you know, fact checkers, they're amazing. They're amazing people. I got into a very serious argument with one of my fact checkers about chess. Oh, that's what it was. Checkers. <laughs> the dog. <laughs> <laughs> my fact-checking person was like mind melt we did it yes no so she's like checkers had died by the time watergate was happening <laughs> so you can't do tapes about watergate with checkers and then i'm like yes i can yeah. <laughs> this book is made up so that's th those are the three things i deliberately made up uh, over the objections of the fact checker you know and it's uh did you know there's uh, did you know there's an app there's a part of your Alexa app in which you can go back and hear all the times you called Alexa by accident and you say like oh no not now that reminded me of the supposed uh, Nixon tapes in which he is yelling at checkers to get off the documents you know like. I actually have an Alexa story related to this book which is that the other day, I was trying to give the junior family members some uh, grounding in American history. And so I was trying to recite the Gettysburg Address to her. And I. Normal parent. I sort of did it. I, I, I got most of the way, but I was, I was messing up. I was like, are we highly resolving? What are we doing? So I was like, Alexa, can you recite the Gettysburg Address? And so she recited it. It uh, goes all the way through, just Alexa monotone, these dead shall not have died in vain, the government of the people, by the people, for the people, shall not perish from the earth. By the way, you have one new message. <laughs> <laughs> Story of our times. words of Abraham Lincoln. <laughs> <laughs> by the way. So anyway, the baby's going to think that was part of the address. That's, that's amazing. Um, Talk to us a little bit. I couldn't help but notice so many of the people that you made fun of in this book are no longer with us. They're dead. Uh, and I was wondering if you could talk as a comedian or a comedian, uh, whichever you prefer. Uh, there's so much worry. You know, you have folks like Dave Chappelle talking about how he won't go to college campuses anymore. Meanwhile, you're writing AP US history. Uh, could you talk to us about cancel culture and how that fractures into your analysis or your process when you're trying to make us laugh? Well, I feel like one way that it's been factoring in, which is a sort of a, a tangential answer, is if you, as an author, I like to go through and like reload my page on Amazon. Uh, Disclosure, Jeff Bezos, founder and CEO of Amazon, owns the Washington Post. Um, <laughs> the, and on the, Does he? On the, on the history page, on the like, here are the top 100 historical books, there's always like, like the top three are like, I've been canceled and I hate things and like, you can't say that anymore. And like, and it's just like a, a massive bestseller. Like I've been unable to crack like the levels where books that are like, what, I'm saying it? Like they're, they're way up there. Uh, and so I feel like I'm like, I'm trying not to say things that are problems is like obviously not gonna be up with the thing. And also all of the books are somebody crossing the Delaware. I, I noticed like mostly it's like, like here's Laura Ingram on the brow of the ship being like of the I Zing. And then there's like Colin Quinn, like roasting America. But I like that I'm behind in the, in the boat. It is a very subtle, you know, I looked at the book several times before I realized you were behind George Washington. Is that George Washington? I don't yeah, know. Yeah, no, it's like, a, it's a subtle little, ta you know, just, here I am, just peering over, uh, <laughs> you, hanging out. You are the Easter egg. It's exactly. Like, <laughs> it's like pretty, pretty entertaining. Uh, we're gonna take some questions. So, but if, first, yes. <laughs> before we get there, we just want you to know that uh, there's a microphone right there. You have to take the questions within the microphone. I've given been given specific instructions that we cannot take questions from seats. Uh, but before we get to those questions, something's going to happen. Yes, so I have a bag of ducks, of rubber ducks that look like the president's because Norton has been far too enabling in my desire to do a fun thing at each event. So 
I, if I leave here with these ducks, I will have failed. And so I would like to give them away by having people answer some trivia questions. Would that be cool? Yeah. yeah. So uh, does anyone want to do that? Yay. Uh, so I will. Do you want me to open them for yeah, you? Yeah, if you wouldn't mind opening the ducks. Well, let's, let's see. So, okay. This gentleman asked if they had to give the right answer. So, so question one. <laughs> According to the campaign song, little know ye who is coming if John Quincy not be coming. What is coming if John Quincy not be coming? <laughs> A, famine. B, Bannon. C, plunder. D, wonder. E, slavery. F, knavery. G, jobbin. H, robin. I, knives. J, fear and pestilence. K, hatin. L, satan. Or M, all of the above. That's correct, you get a duck. <laughs> Yes. Oh. <laughs> I'll I'll hand them out. <laughs> Sorry. Okay, who else wants to answer the Sorry. question? Sorry. Okay, I see a hand over there. Blue shirt. The answer. the answer was M, all of the above. The answer was M. Okay, according to Parson Weems' George Washington biography, which of the following did George Washington's father say to him when he said he couldn't tell a lie, he had cut down the cherry tree? Thank you for your honesty, or... Run to my arms, you dearest boy. Run to my arms. Glad am I, George, that you killed my tree, for you have paid me for it a thousandfold. Such an act of heroism in my son is more worth than a thousand trees, though blossomed with silver and their fruits of purest gold. It's B! <laughs> you come up with, you gotta run over you here. You a duck. <laughs> All right. Um, <laughs> who else wants a duck? Okay, I see a hand. You can't stop now. <laughs> okay, Eric, I see your hand. Um, all right. Liberty's mouth was so close to my face that his whiskers tickled my ear. I whispered back, nobody is going to use you. They might as well try to tame a thousand wild horses with nothing but a whistle. Is this or is this not a line from Rush Limbaugh's series of self-insert historical fiction novels for middle grade readers? <laughs> What? <laughs> what? I think it, has to be. it is! <laughs> it's from Rush Revere and the Brave Patriots. What duck do you think this is, Alex? Oh, that's Ronald Reagan. This is Ronald Reagan! <laughs> All right. You You're welcome. Who else wants a duck? I see you. Okay. Uh, Chelsea. Uh, <laughs> All right. Uh, as I blow up my microphone. All right. So. Uh, this is going to be a short series of questions, so one of these, and it's called Garfield or Garfield? <laughs> so, which Garfield did the thing is the question that we're going to have to tackle as a, as a group. As a, was born in the kitchen of Mama Leone's Italian restaurant. Cat. The cat, that's correct! Uh, which president is this? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> President, Obama. <laughs> President Obama couldn't tell. I need a, another duck. Another duck. Uh, all right. Uh, was fed beef broth rectally for three months until he died. <laughs> oh, the president! That's correct. Who, who gets the duck? She does. <laughs> Here you go. I believe you got Teddy Roosevelt. Yeah, yeah, good duck there. All right, I see another hand. Uh, which Garfield loves lasagna? <laughs> I, I, I'm sorry, you have two options. Which Garfield, the one that loves lasagna or the one that would have preferred lasagna to being fed beef broth rectally for three months and then dying, which happened to him? Yeah, it's a cat. All right, duck this man. Raise your hand, please. Sweater. Oh, look at Tricky Duck. <laughs> Tricky Duck. Tricky Duck. <laughs> and the most worrisome thing is there was a book published about this afterward that said called Feeding Per Rectum, as illustrated in the case of the late <laughs> President Garfield and others. <laughs> <laughs> Which I don't love. Um, okay, let's two do more. two more ducks. Yeah. Okay. 
Mike Pence delivered a birthday address. Oh, I didn't ask anybody. To, I see your hand. Your hand. Uh, you'll be the final question. Okay. I'll do this one, and then I will do you. Perfect. Okay. Mike Pence delivered a birthday address to him on the floor of the House of Representatives. Cat or president? Cat! Oh! <laughs> no, Oh. Okay, sir. Sick burn. Uh, in his address, Mike Pence described him as a human in a cat suit and a large orange American tradition. <laughs> it's your cat! <laughs> Yay! There you go, sir. All right. I think that's all the ducks we're going to inflict. Uh, <laughs> so thank you. <laughs> Oh man, oh man. Nature is healing. Um, you know, you, you know, Alex, you and I are of a certain age where uh, people are having a lot of younger members added to their family. And so I, you know, if you didn't read uh, Alex's column about, or columns about pregnancy, giving birth, they're just incredibly memorable, meaningful things. Uh, you know, uh, I used to work with Dave Barry. He would say that making people laugh is harder than making people cry. <laughs> and I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about your maternal journey and how that's changed your approach to humor. I do feel like becoming a parent, which I know everyone says, like all the things about becoming a parent everyone has said before and are, are going to say again, so I'm just going to say it because that's, you know, it's part of the human experience. Um, but I do feel like everything sort of hits harder because you're just sort of a little more exposed. Like you feel like there's a little bit of you out there that isn't you that you can't control and can't protect fully. And it just makes everything, when you see bad things happen, it feels like, oh, like, instead of being like, well, it couldn't happen to me because I'm me and I'm all of me. It's like, there's somebody else out there who isn't me and I don't want anything to happen to. And so, like, I don't know. I, I used to be sort of, like, hardy going through, like, war movies and stuff. And now I'm watching them. And I'm like, but they all, they, they had parents. And it's just, <laughs> every person had a parent. And just, I don't know. So it's like, I, I always joked that, like, nothing like be becoming a professional humor writer to make everything slowly like not be funny to you anymore and get more and more serious but i do feel like there's some things that i'm like oh th like there's people in there now and i i can't you know joke about it but i also feel like i've gotten better at doing voices when i read uh, nice. <laughs> so from a comedic perspective it takes away but it also gives uh, i've been like we've had to read the monster at the end of this book so many times a classic great grover um, yes, uh, and I do what I describe to myself incorrectly as a wonderful Grover voice, um, and uh, which Emma's gonna someday hear the real Grover and she'll just be really confused. Um, but yeah. don't leave us hanging yeah. like this. Uh. Like, uh, uh, what did that say on the cover? What did that say? <laughs> <laughs> you know. The amazing thing about that is it sounds a little bit like Yoda, yeah. yes. <laughs> who is played by We're Frank Oz, who plays Grover. Yeah. So you're, 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 I, you're, it's true to the source material. I know, I know. <laughs> you're getting yeah. there. Yeah. Let's pass the fact checkers. Yeah. Uh, we're gonna we're gonna take some questions if you have any. Uh, again, the microphone's right there. You need to approach the microphone to ask your question. Uh, and while they're coming up, could you just talk to us a little bit? You know, history is the hot topic. You've said before that uh, the world's becoming more absurd, which means it's less funny. Could you talk a little bit about, given the conditions in which we are now living, in which the country is, these things the country is wrestling with, uh, what it means to produce humor at a time like this? <laughs> oh, I feel like the worst person to ask a question like this is always like a humor writer. I'm like, yeah. I'm just going and I, I try to, because uh, like the, the thing that I'm trying to do is write jokes and the thing that I'm 
bad at doing is like describe feelingly exactly what it is that I'm doing. But I hope like insofar as people can come away, like every day that I stare at the news, I want to scream and it's terrifying. And it's like, it, it, it makes you feel very lonely. And I think when you try to do something that makes someone laugh, they can, it's like making eye contact across the room and be like, you're also seeing this, like we're seeing this together. And hopefully like, you, you you have a moment of like we know that this is ridiculous and like it's scary but it's also ridiculous and like we can connect over that it is the hope that it's like we I, I feel like that that's what I'm trying to do and have somebody yell at the news with you so that's <laughs> that yeah. makes sense that makes sense sir you have a question uh, yes uh, first thank you for your work a uh, common phrase at my house is did you read Alexandra Petri sorry uh, <laughs> today um, <laughs> It must be incredibly difficult to be absurd humorist in a time when politics is so absurd and they get paid a lot more for it. Um, but I was wondering if the Washington Post has probably the worst collection of right-wing authors in the country, except for George Will when he writes about baseball. But my question is, have you ever thought of asking all of them to give you their columns a day in advance so we can just <laughs> jump right to the absurdity of it all? Oh, that, wow. There, there's an idea. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, companion pieces, you know. I feel like with, if their approach to deadline is like my approach to deadline, that's physically impossible. <laughs> <laughs> I, I like the idea that they're all filing a day in advance. <laughs> so, yeah, maybe their approach to deadline is better than my approach to deadline, and they're getting uh, their commentary in with plenty of time to spare. And I, uh, But so the short answer, I guess, is no, but... That's a that, that's making me think. <laughs> <laughs> well, just take one at a time. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Do you have any other questions? Oh. Um, first of all, as a survivor of the sixty pages of jokes, <laughs> <laughs> oh, no. yeah. um, you've really come far. Um, but my actual question, though, is: Is there anything that you really wanted to include in the book, and just like? found it either too esoteric or just like you couldn't quite make it work. Oh, man. Well, I kept trying to do a piece about the Millerites, uh, the ones who were like, we're going to definitely be taken up, you know, uh, because our religion is correct and we have a specific date when that's going to happen because that to me is like my favorite kind of like religious goof when you're like, no, it's going to be Thursday and then <laughs> then it's not. And then you're like, it'll, it'll be like a little later, Thursday, but a little later. And then you're like, well, it'll be Friday. And then, then you like move it a couple of months and it's just like, and so I had this like RSVP thing, but it wasn't quite coming together um, because I don't know, there were just too too many threads going for the, the Millerites. So I guess if I get to write volume two of this, maybe I'll finally succeed in making a Millerite joke. The other one was, I was like, I've been desperate to write a joke about Jonathan Edwards, Sinners in the Hand of an Angry God sermon. And just for some reason, uh, and just I'm haunted by his image of like the spider dangling like a loathsome insect. And so first I wrote one that was just like, you may already be a sinner, like uh, act now. But that didn't quite work. And then I was like, no, I know a better tack to do will be to write one where what if the Obama-Clinton-Edwards debates were Obama-Clinton and Jonathan Edwards from the 19th century? And that's the only time anyone's ever laughed at that concept. <laughs> and the execution was just like, this isn't working. Um, and so there is one in there, which is the spider, uh, getting to do a little retort. And so eventually it did make it in there, but that was another one that took a lot of wangling. There are some Puritan jokes that I found to be particularly entertaining. There's a list of uh, t Puritan toys or top toys, <laughs> you know, which is like the difficult to bake oven and. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Sarah, you have a. Question. Oh hi. Um, yeah, uh, your, your dad was a congressman from my home state of Wisconsin. Hey. I didn't know how to pronounce his name either. Um, but um, I just wanted you to talk about: was that sort of something that led you toward or away from what you're doing now, or just what was it like in general to be a congressman's kid? Oh, it was really neat because I feel like the best part of the job and like is you get to go to a lot of interesting places and just hear from people who are doing things like you get to go to like oh here's like a farm that exports stuff all over the world and like they'll tell you how they do it and like just really meet interesting people and people who like care about their government and want 
it to go well and like you would go to a parade and people would come up after like having ridden on the fireman float and be like but here's my idea for how i change like i want to change things and like here's a system that i have and it was just neat getting to like you know meet so many people and i feel like journalism uh ideally is sort of similar where you get to go to a lot of places and talk to a lot of people and like get to see everyone's different frameworks so i think it made like having all those cool experiences made me kind of want to be a writer and so it, it did feel into that uh and yeah no it was a treat hi dad <laughs> dad's hair um you know one of the i i, I want, had been thinking about this you have such a vast array of knowledge now when you're putting these things together is this just coming from the head or are you doing active research in terms of like looking up documents and I would do some active research once like sometimes I would just have an idea and I'm like I think this idea is silly but in order to determine whether or not it's silly I need to read six books um, and so that was a lot of fun like a lot of it was just giving yeah. me an excuse to like learn about Cotton Mather um, <laughs> if you want to hear about or just like go dive into a weird primary source document like my husband uh, can attest that like my idea of a fun vacation just like reading to him from Gore Vidal's memoir and he'll be like why is this happening this is our honeymoon stop um, but <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so many people want Gore Vidal on their honeymoon. <laughs> yes, sir. I have a pretty generic question, which is just writers and performers who influenced you when you were growing up and, and even more recently, but just give us a little short list of people that you really find funny and you really feel inspired by, whether they're people who write for a living or do stand-up comedy or acting, comic acting. There must be a long list. Yeah, it, do, it is a very us. long list, but I feel like my first love was always like people who wrote humorous things for the page, and so I'm a big fan of James Thurber, obviously. Uh, yeah. Love him, love The Night the Bed Fell is one of the funniest things ever written. Uh, just everything in my life in hard times. There's this whole part where he describes how he's failing to use a microscope so 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 badly that it makes his teacher angry at him. <laughs> and I'm just like, this is this is hilarious. Uh, and Dor Dorothy Parker, I feel like her aphorisms are so funny, but then all the short stories are like, this is sad. Um, mm. And the poetry is like, oh no, go to therapy. Um, <laughs> but but like in a in a deep dark powerful way um but then like robert benchley who was her best bud like i discovered him later because i'd sort of read through all the thurber and then there was thurber himself was like benchley did everything that i did but funnier in 30 years ago and it's kind of true like he's so good um and all of his stuff is he's just like i'm slightly baffled by the world but in a delightful way um and then like on the internet there's so many people who are hilarious like like ali brosh like with what she does with like uh ms paint uh, and like Danny Lavery, like I would like read him write the uh, telephone book is one of one of those people. Yeah. Um, and just like I'm trying to think of like comedic actors now. Um, I don't uh, or, or, or stand up comics. Oh yeah, I mean Mitch Hedberg is classic. Uh, and. John Mulaney, like, is mostly, I've received him as a, like, filtered via the memes. So I, I don't know that I've actually ever, like, sat down and watched it. I've just, like, seen so many GIF sets that I feel like I've se watched the entirety of his stand-up opera because he's so quotable and, like, so well-written. Um, and who, oh, man, I, I, this would, this would be one of those things where I'll just sit here and then, like, ten minutes from now, I'll be like, oh, and of course, my number one influence, Oscar Wilde. And, of course, my number one influence, Oscar Wilde. Uh, and, yeah. Uh, no, he's he's pretty funny. The baby has gotten a uh, book of Oscar Wilde quotations because it's small and she has small hands. And so she carries it around. And sometimes she has it right side up and it looks like she's reading it. Mostly not. But sometimes, and I'm like, my child is so impressive. But... Um, <laughs> Mostly it's upside down. She's going to be an engineer one day. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> She's going to be a chef. She's, yeah. yeah, I don't, I don't know. She can let, do whatever she wants. Let the record show that Alex said GIF and not GIF. Yeah. <laughs> it just and felt, you, you know, yes. it draws ooze, much like my book. His name is George <laughs> Floyd. <laughs> <laughs> Madam. 
Um, so my question is, um, my barometer for the news is whether your article is satire or not. And so one of the most moving ones that you wrote was the one after January 6th um, with your line, proud boys will be boys after all. And then um, the one a couple weeks ago after the school shooting, and I'm someone who works in school, so that hit really close to home for me. So I was wondering if there's, like, walk us through your process. Is there a moment when the news is just too hard to even try to find a moment of satire in that you just, you sit down, you're like, this is going to be a serious one, or like, how does that come out? That, that pretty much describes it. Like, I feel like one of the things that I always try to do for myself and for like, in order to keep writing is that I'm always like, I'm not going to try to make something funny if I don't think it's funny. Yeah. And so like, I've always like, but if there's news that I want to write about and I have nothing funny to say, I can still write something about it. I yeah. just won't try to say anything funny. And I think knowing that I can do that allows me to be like, oh, but like this one is funny though. And I can like have a nice time on it, but I don't have to do that every time. And like uh, having that valve, like some days you're just like, this is a bleak week. And, mm -hmm. uh, but I, I don't want to not say anything. And I, yeah, so I'm, I'm glad that you appreciated both of those things because sometimes I'm like, and then at, at the bottom of the column, it always says like a lighter take on the opinions of the day. And it'll be like my most angry, serious column. And it'll be like, <laughs> but that's the problem. Every like 10 years, you get a picture taken and my picture is like, ah. but uh, like, yeah. Is it, isn't it from your Jeopardy? That's on my Twitter. My okay. Twitter thing is from my Jeopardy okay. appearance when I was a wee. Uh, college freshman. How'd you do? Uh, very poorly. Okay. Uh, I came in, I should say, I came in, I came in third. Yeah. <laughs> it's almost like there are 16 people on this stage. Yeah, exactly. Sir, we have time for one more question, hey, though. Hey. How are you doing? Oh. Oh, sorry. Didn't mean to dislodge your mic. I also came in third on Jeopardy, so fun oh, club. Yeah. Um, Fuzzy. Durah. How many people here have been on Jeopardy? <laughs> Okay, here we are. <laughs> uh, so I'm curious, because your book obviously has such a wide range of sources and material, but the one sort of through line of the book is that everything is American. And I'm wondering if writing this book of the sort of depths of the history of the country gave you any sort of different understanding or appreciation of like what America is and has been over time. Well, and, how, so and how different it might be from like a... British history book or a French history book, or if there's anything like uniquely American about what you're doing. Oh, that's interesting. Because it was funny. Because initially I was like, "Oh, it's annoying that I won't be able to make jokes about X, Y, or Z." And then I'm like, "No, T. S. Eliot was American. I can make <laughs> jokes about cats all I want." And it's like, it's amazing how many people really are American when you get down to it. Um, like, uh, I feel like there was some guy in some book who's like, "What's wrong with American history? It's as good as any history in the world." And there's so much less of it. Um, so I do feel like, uh, I mean, Oscar Wilde obviously said that America's uh, longest tradition is its youth, <laughs> which, yeah. which I kind of like. Um, but I kept being like, oh, I, th that person was British. I can't write about them. That would be a different book. So it was, it was a useful delimiting factor in terms yeah. of like, uh, what am I writing and what am I not writing? And it was also like, there is sort of, because of the whole sort of sense of like, oh, like here there's some novelty uh, in, in a lot of the folks who are like writing things. They're like, this will be like, like Walt Whitman, like how sort of big and like stridy the poems are. Yeah. Uh, it feels very like, I don't know. I feel like you read a lot of like European, what is my microphone doing? It's fascinating. Um, <laughs> And they're like very meticulous and bejeweled, and I don't feel like there's a lot of meticulous bejeweled stuff. Although I didn't have any Henry James, so maybe, <laughs> maybe uh, there would be meticulous bejeweled stuff if I had Henry James. I feel like we contain multitudes, is what is what I discovered. Thank you. <laughs> well, Alex, thank you so much for doing this. This is wonderful. Do you have any parting words for? And copies of Alex's book are available to check out this. She'll be up here signing. Please form a line to the right of the table behind this woman here who's in a wheelchair. And help our staff by folding up your chairs, please. Thanks again for coming.